testing, testing. Alrighty. On, we got sound. We just don't have a Bruce yet. All of his working late nights finally caught up to him, I guess. I don't know. He could be asleep. Well, it's yeah, true. A lot of stuff going around. Yep. That was like, uh, was it Friday? Friday looked like it was warm out. Yeah, but it wasn't. It was cold. And then you go outside and you're like, I need a jacket. But spring is around the corner, right? I mean, technically spring's here because it's... What, a couple days ago? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> all right, so we got folks on. Excellent. Good morning to you all. Thanks for joining us. Um, I guess really the only thing, two things I guess. One, um, in April, April 26th, 27th, 28th, that's that weekend we're going to be in Chicago. Um, so that 28th, we won't be, we won't be meeting. Um, and some good news with that is um, Matt Walker, uh, his church that's, close to Pheasant Run where we went last year in July, um, he's asked us to come speak that Sunday morning. Well, us. Uh, to come speak that Sunday morning at their church. So we'll get to do that. That should be fun. Um, and so <coughs> we get to go up there and then head over to Fox River Bible Church. And we get to speak there, so... That should be fun. That should be fun. Um, we'll miss the Sunday mornings services that morning at the conference, but that's okay. And then June 21st, 22nd, 23rd here. And I'm still trying to get solid yeses from folks, so we'll see what happens. Dean Antonucci has looked into flight. Uh, and he's looking for ones that he can cancel in case his health doesn't allow him to come. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, he's looking at coming flying in, so I think that's a pretty decent yes about showing up. So <clears throat> that's good to think about. I'm trying to think, there's anything else? I don't think there's anything else that's coming up, so. Um,
Yeah. All right. Um, Romans 16. Uh, we'll continue on dealing with uh, this issue in Romans 16, specifically verse 17, and uh, <clears throat> see how far we can get. Delilah told me that um, she's got an idea that we want to do something. And so she said, you need to finish Romans 16 by next week. I said, that's not happening. I think we all know that's not happening. Um, <clears throat> it was showing like sound. Yeah. yeah, I do too. Do you have sound there? Somebody saying there's no sound? No. It might be your phone, maybe. Check, check. I mean, it's showing sound back here, so double check it, make sure. Okay, it just might be your phone. All right. Um, yeah, the optimism is its there, I guess. All right, um, Romans 16. Um, I'm going to start in verse 17, read through verse 20. And um, we'll, see, we'll see how far we can get through this um, <clears throat> today. Verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and, co and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. There's the sound. For they, that, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and, and by good, work, good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple, for your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but, I, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And, that, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word. May we take the information that we studied today, uh, study it out for ourselves, find out whether or not that is so. And then when we find out what your word says, we take that information and apply it to our lives that we might be able to live a life glorifying to your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So one of the first things that we've talked about here is, um, you know, this, this idea we talked about last week was that separation, right? Uh, and doctrine of separation is one of those things, you know, Delilah and I were talking about this earlier. She's like... Um, when are we going to be able to get more people to show up? And I was like, well, here's the thing. A lot of people probably won't because of what we teach. So, I mean, for instance, Friday morning, they asked me to come speak um, at FCA at school. And so I'm reading through some passages, and I'm talking about, and I, and I show them in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, and everybody quotes verse 9 about, uh, you know, we... Uh, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered the heart of man the things of God, that God's prepared to them for, for, uh, for him that love him. Um, and I know I messed that up. But they, they read that verse, and then they say, well, say you just don't know what God's for. And so what I, the Christian life doesn't. tells us. we're going through that and I was talking to him about the fact that don't fall for this idea that you don't you don't have enough you aren't enough and you just never know what God's going to do like he's some mystical creature in the sky just waiting to see what's going to happen to zap you with um, acne on the, the night before prom or whatever it is because you know you've got some secret you know things like that um, but the fact that you're complete in him so we were talking about that, and then, and then I went and I finished with, uh, Galatians 2.20. Um, and, a guy, and a guy raised his hand. He said, so are you saying that the life that we live is by the faith of Jesus Christ? And I said, well, that's what the verse says. I'm not saying it, but that's what the verse says. The problem with that is they go check their Bible, and it doesn't say that. It says faith in Christ. Okay, And every time that you look at that 
the, that statement where Paul uses, and he says, faith of Christ, or faith of Jesus Christ, or the faith of Christ Jesus, every one of those other versions change it to faith in Christ. So then, we're, we're talking about this tonight. What happens is, is they're going to talk about your faith and what you do. And so then that's one of those things when we start talking about this religious system. Um, that's what that religious system does is it makes it about you. Right? So then what we do is we take a look at this and we're going to look at this separation here. We separate ourselves from that religious system. So then people who are in that religious system, they're never going to show up here <laughs> until they get themselves out of that religious system. And so then, you know, there are a couple of people still like yeah this is this is this sounds good um but then there's certain people like this guy's crazy and i'm like we care about what the verses say what the words on the page say and we don't care about this system we don't care about that system obviously but we don't care about that system either and so then that's the difference between us and the, rest of the people which is why we can't build a multi-million dollar building like one of the local Baptist churches did. And if you preach a gospel or a system that's here that brings people in because they're going to want to they're going to want to feed that flesh which is what that system does. Right? And so it's one of those things, huh? No, it's not that you're not that you should say you're sorry for you saying anything, but I mean it's one of those things. It's frustrating. It gets frustrating because you know, but then you get to the point you're like, I know that that's going to be bigger than what we're ever going to be, ever. And that's why most Grace churches are around 15 to 20 people, uh, and we're smaller than that, but that's okay. Um, but that's that that's that problem. This is what we're fighting against. And us in the capital city, there's so many other things that's going on, which is why that's so hard to break. And most people go to be entertained. And most people go to be entertained. I mean, and here's the thing, here's the thing. So when I'm speaking to this group of students and adults, there are absolutely zero Bibles. Why would you go to an FCA thing where somebody's going to speak about the Bible and not have your Bible. Because are you really interested in what the Bible actually says if you don't have your Bible and you go to a place where somebody's going to talk about the Bible? Yeah. And so then I talked to him about it. I said, okay, so this is what, this is what it means by the faith of Christ. <clears throat> and so we had a conversation but in his mind, I'm a lunatic, right? Because what you're really saying is you live by the faith of Christ. The answer is yes, because that's what the verse says. Every single time. Again, like I said, you go check it, his Bible doesn't say that. So then we end up back where we're, his religious system says that his version is right. And then then we end up with, and it all goes back to that system, right? So it's one of those things. Is it frustrating? Is it um, disheartening? Is it discouraging that we don't have 80 people? Who cares because we're getting this information, right? And the information is the most important part. So then we go and do something with the information. Um, and it's one of those things, we, we've talked about this before, we're not here to build a big movement. We're not here to build a big building. We're here to, what? Get people saved and bring them to the knowledge of the truth. Well, <clears throat> we've got people here, people online, who are saved, as far as I know, and I can't read anybody's minds or their hearts, but they're coming to the knowledge of the truth. So then, we just keep doing that. All right, And that's one of those things that, that, that we work on. Right, but that's one of those things when we when we think about this um, in in Romans chapter sixteen verse seventeen. This idea of this separation, 
what happens is if you separate yourself and there's there's three different types of separation four technically um, with this one but um, when you separate yourself from the world you put yourself in a small minority very quickly which is usually that religious system is what you've got left well if you separate yourself from a religious system then you make yourself even a smaller minority and then you start talking about erring brethren so people that are saved that may have error in their behavior so then now you made yourself into a smaller group and then when you look at their doctrine now you're at a smaller group and so then if you think about the pool of people that you can draw from by the time you get here it's kind of small which is why there's there's that small group of people that are left and it's not a huge group of people you know when you, when you start taking a look at this stuff you're just going to be in a small group no matter what and that's why was, that's what we were talking about earlier is because of what we teach we're always going to be small no matter where you go I mean even in big cities like Chicago Brother Jordan his church it's not that huge there's not a lot of people you know a couple hundred people but you think you got millions of people in Chicago a couple hundred people go to their church so I mean you know it's one of those things you, you think about what's going to take place and then the 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 sample size that you have left to pull from it's going to be a small group of people so it's you know you don't worry about numbers and all that stuff um, but there's there's some things that I want to make sure that we get here before we move on one go get uh, go get first uh, go get Philippians chapter 3 <clears throat> yeah Philippians chapter 3, um, <clears throat> start in verse 14. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. There's two times where Paul uses this term, mark them. Okay? Uh, the first one we see in Romans 16, um, he says, mark and avoid. All right? So notice in, in, in um, Philippians chapter 3, starting off in, what did I say, 14? 17? 17? 14. No, you're fine. So start off in verse 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. Now what's he mean by perfect there? All right. When you talk about perfect, what's he mean when he says perfect? Complete, complete right? Where do we find that completeness? As you said, is in Christ, right? So this idea of being perfect, he's talking about people who understand who they are in Christ and the fact that they are complete and they are mature adults, right? And that's what he's dealing with here. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. All right, so he's saying, I want you to think the same way that I'm telling you to think, okay? So if you're perfect, you're complete, you understand all that stuff, he says, <clears throat> be thus minded, and if, if, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, notice, God shall reveal even this unto you. So he's saying, here is a way that I want you to think based upon the fact that we're perfect and complete. And he says, I want you to think this way. And if you think a different way, what's God going to do? He says, what? <clears throat> God shall reveal even this unto you. Philippians 3. Verse 16. He says, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. And what he's doing, he's saying, I want you to live your life based upon the knowledge that you have. And the problem is, and this is what I was telling the students at school, is your Christian life will not work on the basis of ignorance. God wants us to know some things. And he's saying, I want you to think a certain way. Well, how can you think a certain way if you don't know how to think? Right? And so then he's saying, I want you to think this way. And if you don't think this way, God's going to reveal it to you. 
And so, you know, we talk about the verse over in uh, Timothy where he says, um, where he talks about a guy pulling himself out of the snare of the devil. And it's only through understanding some information. We have to know some things. And then he says, notice in verse 17, <clears throat> Brethren, be ye followers together of me. All right. He's saying, follow me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. So he's saying, I want you to watch and I want you to pay attention to the way people walk. And if they walk the same way that I do, notice what he says. Mark them which, which, walk, which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have often told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Doesn't that remind us of what we said, what we read over in Romans 16, where he talks about the fact that they're after their own belly? All right, we'll look at that again. And whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now, what I want you to look at is verse 18 and 19 is a parenthetical thing, right? So what I want us to do is read verse 17 and then 19, and you'll see what he's saying here. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example, verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven. Our conversation is what? That's our walk. Is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. All right. Then he says in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. So do you know what he's saying? And I would almost say, you know, he talks about <clears throat> cleave to that which is good and avoid that which is not, all right? And so then that's what I want you to think about in this situation. What's he saying here? You have us for an example, which is just a person who's a living example of what the life's supposed to be and the walk that we're supposed to have. He says, I want you to look at us and compare everybody to how they walk to our walk. You have us for an example. You have us for a thing that you're supposed to compare people to. And if they walk the same way we do, he says, what? You have them for an example. He says, mark them. Now, what is it that we talked about last week? What's he mean when he says, mark them? He says, pick them out, name them, and let people know about it. The only two times that he says mark them, he says mark them, say their name, tell why they're marked as creating some division. We'll look at that. But then he also says mark them and name them who follow the same example or example that I've given you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's fine. I mean... When you, start, when you start naming people, all right? Well, you know, everybody says, well, um, you're a Les Feldick person. You're a Jordanite. You're, you're a Stam guy. You're whoever. Gregites? Gregtonians? That's not even a thing. It's not even a thing. Gregtonians. <laughs> That sounds like some sort of city somewhere, Greg Tonia. Um, but I mean, but that, but that's the issue, right? You want to say, here's who you 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 mark them. You say, here's the person that I would I would say I could model my life by. And what we do is we cleave to them. And really, what the issue is is what, chapter four, verse one. Therefore. My brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for, my, crown, my joy and crown, so stand fast, where? In the, Lord. In the Lord. So what he's saying is, don't give up ground. All right? When you get to a point, you know, we've talked about this before. You get saved, and you start off at this point, and you start learning some doctrine. 
right? And what he's saying is, when you get to this doctrine, don't give up. Just keep pushing forward. Take your stand on it. We've said this before. When you stand on a doctrine, you don't have to get up out of your seat when it comes time to stand for the doctrine. You've just always stood for it, and he's saying, don't give up ground. Don't go backwards. He's saying, keep moving forward with it. Really, the idea is just get on with it and go do what you're supposed to do. Right? And that's the issue. He says, here's some people you need to mark and avoid, and here's some people that you need to mark and follow and cleave to. All right? And that's, that's one of those things that we have to keep in mind as we go through with this, marking and avoiding, marking and standing fast. And this separation allows us to do that. Now, the big issue that he's talking about here is that 3B. In Romans 16, that's what he's dealing with. In, in, in Romans 16 is that 3B, that error in doctrine. Okay? And so what I want to do is just take a look at some of these real quick, and then, then we'll get going. Um, and as I said, there's four different, technically three different ones that we're dealing with. Get, uh, get Galatians chapter 6 again. Um, or did we ever go there? Did we ever go to Galatians 6? We didn't, did we? No. So get Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> and I want you to think about um, what's going on. And it's the same idea. In Romans 16, verse 18, he talks about the fact that um, they serve not Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Okay? And we saw that over there in, in the other passages as well in, in, in uh, Philippians. So Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> Um, start off in verse, verse 12. So Galatians chapter 6, verse 12, he says, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Now I want you to think about something real quick. Now, what's the issue there in Galatia is what? People were coming in saying, you need to be circumcised after the manner of Moses. Now, that's their false doctrine that they're teaching. Okay? They were teaching you need to be circumcised. Now, here's the thing. Um, run, over, run over real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, hold your place there in Galatians. We're going to get back to that. <clears throat> One of the things that we've talked about before is error in behavior. How do you fix that? Well, you go to doctrine. Error in bad doctrine, how do you fix that? You go to doctrine, right? And so that's one of those things that we want to make sure that we get. Um, when Paul's talking about they desire to make a fair show in the flesh by having you be circumcised. Now, I want you to think about that's what their issue was at that time. Well, one of the main issues that we have today is what? If you ever have a chance to talk to somebody about salvation, they say, well, I was baptized when I was 10 years old. Okay? Then we say, that's not my question. What is it that baptism does today is it makes a fair show of the flesh. That's all it is. And then everybody says, well, it's an outward sign of an inward faith. At zero times in, in Scripture has baptism ever been an outward sign of an inward faith. Ever. It's always had to do with an identification with something, whether it's a priesthood or with when Christ was baptized, he was identified among the sinners. And it allowed him to be a priest because that was one of the things you had to have that ceremonial cleansing to become a priest. And so then there's a whole bunch of issues there. But one of the things that we deal with today is what? Baptism. And so then this is something Delilah and I were talking about on the way home from uh, uh, Mount uh, Moorhead on Friday night. Water leak? Is it actually coming down? Right there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I didn't hear the water. But to me, it sounded like it's coming from over there. So we've got water issues in our ceiling, maybe? 
Yeah, yeah. See, here's the good thing about not having a church building is this isn't our problem to fix. But we do need to let them know. How can you hear that half deaf? No, I mean, because one of your ears is... I can't hear it at all. I'm just going to see if that is like wet. Okay. Or if it just looks like Yeah. Talk about baptism. We get water coming from the ceiling. Yeah, I don't think that's new. Okay. No, I was just, I was like, how can you hear that? I've not, I've not heard it at all. Of course, yeah. I'm talking, so. Hmm. Yeah. hmm. Okay. Um, no, you're fine. So Delilah and I were talking about this on the way back home on, on Friday night from Moorhead. Um, and, and it's one of those, it's one of those things that I think a lot of times people out of, um, what's the word I want to use? Zeal, maybe say some things that they probably don't mean or something like that. But I want you to notice something real quick. First Corinthians chapter one, verse seventeen. We were talking about this on the way home. Um, First Corinthians chapter one, verse seventeen. Of course, everybody knows this verse. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. All right. So then, when we talk about this. What, what Paul says is, I, I was not sent to baptize, but I was, be, I was sent to do what? To preach the gospel. All right, so you go over to John 1.33, and it talks about the fact that John the Baptist was sent to baptize. In fact, Jesus Christ tells his disciples that you're going to go and baptize in my name. All right? And that's part of what's going on. And so then Paul is not sent to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So then what some people do is they'll take that verse and say, See, Paul really wasn't an apostle, but Paul was just an evangelist, and God sent him to, to, or Christ sent him to preach the gospel just to be an evangelist. There is zero scriptures that says Paul was just an evangelist. Now, was Paul an evangelist? Yes. But was Paul an apostle? Absolutely. Right? And so then we can get into that. But notice, this is the thing that kind of jumped out at me. A lot of folks read this passage and they say, if you preach baptism, or if you baptize, you make the cross of Christ none effect. Okay? But that's the general idea of what that verse is taken as. I don't see it that way. Now, does that minimize the purpose, the true purpose of the cross? Yes. But, if you look here, notice he says, but to preach the gospel, notice, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. What is it that's going to make the cross of Christ of none effect is what? Wisdom of words. And me going around and talking about words and words and words and words and using these words and this word and that word and the wisdom that's, that this world knows, what's that wisdom of words do is make the cross of Christ of none effect. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I I was watching this guy the other night, the other night I think it was, or the other morning, on uh, one of those TBN fake TBN stations, which to be a fake TBN station and not the real TBN station is pretty fake, because TBN's fake anyway. Uh, so I was watching one of those the other day, and this guy was talking about this vision that God gave him, and he was going on and on about, you know, 2019 is the year of gold and God's going to bring gold into your life. And all, it just, and these people, the whole church is filled, hundreds and hundreds of people. And you get, and I guarantee you, he's on this channel, so he's probably got more than one service. And he's talking about uh, 20 is, um, this number, this is what 20 means, and 19 means um, un, unexpected faith or something. It just this just stuff that he pulls out of the air, pulls out of the air. That's the wisdom of words that makes the cross of Christ of none effect. Not the actual baptism. That and you know, like I said, does that take away from that? Absolutely, but that's not what makes the cross of Christ none effect. It's the wisdom of words. 
But does wisdom of words say you need to be baptized? Does the wisdom of words say you need to be circumcised to the folks in Galatia? Does the wisdom of words say, well, you need to tithe in order to get favor with God? Because that was the other thing that he was getting at, is you've got to give big to get big. And it's just all this junk. And it's wisdom of words that makes the cross of Christ minimize and makes me and my health and my prosperity and my wealth and all that stuff bigger. And it magnifies all that stuff and minimizes the cross. And so then, you know, as you go through there, he, he, he talks about that that preaching of the cross is the power of God. Uh, so when we go back to Galatians chapter 6, I want you to think about this real quick. In, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 12, he says, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. I would say, and I'm not going to say change this, but I'm saying put whatever you think should go in there. All right? That they constrain you to be baptized, that they constrain you to tithe, that they constrain you to pray for a certain type of thing in your life, that they, that they constrain you to do something other than just rest in who you are. You know, as we, as we think about that's what they're doing. But notice, <clears throat> he says, "...only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ, for neither, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law." but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. So when a guy gets up there and he says, are you ready to be baptized? And he pinches their nose and puts them down and says, death, burial, and resurrection. Who's getting the glory there? The guy doing it. He's making a fair show of himself in your flesh and he's using you to promote himself. Rather than just saying, get out of the way and allow the cross to be the issue. And that's the same thing that he's dealing with here that we're dealing with these days. But notice, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where is it that we glory? In the cross. Nowhere else. And so then, it's one of those things, as you look through here, notice he says, By whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. So I want you to think about what he's dealing with here in verses 12 through 15, is he's dealing with these systems right here. Right? He's talking about the world. He says, um, by, by whom? By Christ the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Right? That religious system that says you've got to do this, that, or the other. And then you've got brothers who are erring saying you need to go back to that religious system. And then that, er, that doc, or their doctrine and their error, the error in their doctrine saying you need to go back to that system. All right? And he's dealing with every one of these. Um, not so much the error in behavior, but that comes in other places, all right? And we can take a look at how that works. So, um, real quick, <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. And here's, here's the thing. You go to any church in the world, well, I wouldn't say any, any church in the world, but you go to the majority of Christian churches today, they'll agree with number one. They'll say, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And if we love the world, then the love of God is not in us. And they'll quote verses all day long about them not being part of the world. All right? Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what they say is, if I, if I want to separate myself from the world, what do I do? I stop sinning. Whatever that sin that they want to call. Um, one of the ones we talked about last time was your hair's not big enough, right? Or you don't have the right dress on if you're a woman or... Um, you know, whatever it is, whatever stipulations they want to put, they say, we're different than the world because of things we do. 
What is it that Paul makes the, makes the connection to is what? Don't be conformed to the world, but what? Be transformed by what? Thinking a different way. It's your thought process that he's really going after. Do you know what your thought process is going to do when you start changing the way you think about things? The automatic thing that's going to take place is you stop doing certain things. That's just the way that it's going to be because you start realizing, I'm complete in him. Why do I need to go do this, that, or the other? Like I said, the majority of churches, they'll agree with us on number one. Okay. Uh, second one, the religious system, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 6, <clears throat> this one we've looked at already. Um, verse 14, and again, like I said, verse 14 and on is not dealing with marriage. Now, could you apply it to marriage? Yes, but he's talking more specifically about being entangled with that religious system out there. For instance, we won't have Kenneth Copeland or Joel Osteen at our conference. I'm sorry if you all have a problem with that but it's not going to happen, right? Verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Notice, wherefore, come out from among them. Well, who's the them? That religious system out there. Do you know the majority of churches won't agree with us there? Do you know why? Because they're the religious system. They won't say, be separate from us. They're not going to tell you to leave us because, you know, we were talking Friday night and one of the things that, that Juanita told us, it says there's a, there's, a, there's a guy that she talked to, a pastor, and she said, do you know something about the mystery? And he said, yes. And she said, well, why don't you preach it? And he says, because people won't come and clean the church. They won't come and, and take care of the, the property. They won't come and they won't give and they won't come. So this guy knows the mystery, knows something about it, but won't preach it. And he has not separated himself from that religious system. And he's holding back the greatest truth that mankind would ever know because he doesn't want to leave that religious system. Now, does that sound like he's entangled in that system? Absolutely. And here's the thing. That happens more often than not. I guarantee you, I would almost bet that... Um, if, if any of those guys have ever spent any time in their Bible, they know what we teach. And they know it's right. And they refuse to teach it because they're afraid to lose people. Not just people, their income. Yeah, not just people, but their income. Because what those people do is bring them their income. I guarantee, I, like I said, I'd guarantee you that... <coughs> People like um, John Hagee and all those guys, they know they're not going to get out of that system because they know that that's where they're sitting and that's where they're getting their money. They have their yeah. You'd only have one jet instead of three. Well, God wants me to go all over the word, world and preach the gospel. Why don't you preach it in your own church to begin with? Let's start there. You know, and that's one of those things we think about. <clears throat> Notice what he says in verse seven, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye what? Separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the un unclean thing, and I will receive you. Um, I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. He's saying, come out from among that religious system. So if, if, let me ask you a question. If he says, come out from among them and I will receive you, 
What's that tell me about those people right there? They're not received. What does that mean? I know you asked me first, but what do you think that means? What he's talking about here is this religious system, and none of those people are saved. None of them. I mean, as you go through the passage, what's he dealing with? Um, what fellowship, or be not unequally yoked with what? Unbelievers. Right? And then he says, um, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Um, what communion hath light with darkness? All right. Um, what concord hath Christ with Belial? Um, what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath God with the temple of God with idols? I mean, here's the thing. What's that religious system do? It says, here's some things. And we've said this before. Here's a check sheet go through the check sheet and we get that check sheet done bring it back to us and we'll tell you if you've done it right or not I mean you know the whole thing with um, um, Scientology right so when they created that they had a list of things you had to get to well they the problem was is people got through the list too quickly so they had to well you need to start at the bottom and go through it again by that time, they've got more things, so now they've, they've got these extra classes you've got to go take, and you've got to pay for them to go to, thousands of dollars. And then people got done with that, and were like, well, what am I supposed to do now? They're like, well, you need to start at the bottom and go through it, and then by that time, they've got more stuff. And they say, here's your checklist. Bring the checklist back to us. We're going to check you on this. And if we don't feel like you've met, the, met these standards, then we're going to make you go back and do them, or we'll give you more standards. Well, the problem is, does that sound like they're telling people that they're complete? That's why people won't show up here. <laughs> because they're in that system because they think, I need to do something rather than understanding that they're complete, which is why I was telling those kids and those adults on Friday morning, if you're saved, you are complete. And don't fall into the trap saying that you need to do something to get more complete. The problem is, is when we get down here, we're going to find out that there are saved people, people who are saved, who are teaching false doctrines that are also taking you out of that completeness. Now that's where most of your churches are going to be that have saved people, is that right there. It's different than that religious system. The religious system out there says, here's some things, go do it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, he talks about the fact that these people have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So like I said, when you separate yourself from the world, you get in a small group. And then when you separate yourself from a religious system, it's even smaller. And when you get to brethren who are actually saved, and you separate yourselves from those who behave wrong or have false doctrine, I mean, slim pickings. Which is why, as we're spread out all over the state and all over the country, that's why most of us are small. Because, like I said, when you get down here to the bottom, there's not that many of us out there. This idea that there's millions and millions of people out there, maybe. Right? So they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They look like they're doing the right things. But they're not. Um, third category, when we look at Aaron brethren. Go get uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What we know about 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is what? Paul says that all scriptures give them inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Right? which is what we're taught, Romans is all about, for correction. Doctrine for correction for, yeah. I missed one, didn't I? Reproof. 
reproof, right? For correct for doctrine, for reproof of bad behavior, which is what first and Corinthians, first, second Corinthians is dealing with. And then correction. Correction and bad doctrine, which is what Galatians is all about. But I want you to notice when we look at this, First Corinthians chapter five. <clears throat> First, First Corinthians chapter 5, <clears throat> notice this, verse 1. And I just want you to think about what's going on here. So he's talking about saved people. Okay? So notice this, <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not, much, is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And he's talking about a specific person in that verse 1 who is having a relation with his father's wife. And he's saying, I'm hearing that there's things in your church that even the Gentiles out here are ashamed of. And I want you to think about how ashamed those people are when you think about Romans chapter 1, as you go through Romans chapter 1, and to think, I mean, you think about the stuff that we see out here today and the things that are now being accepted. And we'd mentioned this before, and it's not that we're prophets or anything, but this stuff's coming to pass. One of the things that we talked about was when they legalized gay marriage, one of the next things it was going to be is pedophilia. And right now, they're doing it. And they're not only saying that it's now legal in certain places, but they're now saying that this person suffers from something. Adults who prefer children. So you're just one step away from saying, well, it's not a sickness. It's something that, that's just what it is, and we have to accept it. And they're actually talking about adding them to the LGBT, XYZ, whatever they are now. They're adding that to that. What was once called sin, they're saying, well, it's okay because it's just an issue. Well, soon it's going to be, well, it's just okay. And it's going to be accepted. You think, well, that's not going to happen. Well, it did. It is right now. You think 20 years ago, Ellen DeGeneres lost her TV show on program because she came out as homosexual. Every commercial that you see now has at least one, one homosexual couple in it. At least one. Every one of them. So it's gone from, we're going to say, this is wrong, to, well, it's something that people have to deal with, to, well, you're just going to have to accept it. And every bit of this... <clears throat> in the state of Kentucky... Um, you all know some of the laws that's been passed in the state of Kentucky. One, you can conceal carry without permit, right? That's going to be going through pretty soon. You know what another one was? Bestiality is now in the state of Kentucky. No. Well, it's always been. Unless I'm wrong, unless what I've read is wrong. I mean, you think about you think about where we're going as a society. This whole decade, I'm talking about this at work last week. <clears throat> this whole decade has been amazing in so many. I'm not saying it's great. Yeah. I'm just saying it's been amazing. In so many things that have happened, whether it be social, which is what how quickly, about, and technology, how you quickly, know, yeah. You look at how far smartphones have come. Mm -hmm. Just since 2010, mm -hmm. the insurance industry is now, what, and medical industry is upside down. Nobody mm -hmm. knows what in the world's going on. It's a completely messed up mm -hmm. uh, business. Uh, and then socially, like what you're, we were talking. Exactly about that. 
when they legalize gay marriage. All of your, well, I don't want to say all, a lot of your church people, some conservatives came out and said, next thing will be pedophilia. And then everybody said, oh, no, it's, we just, we have to legalize gay marriage. It's got to be, you know, they, they deserve to be just as miserable as the rest of us. And then the next thing you know, it is a very common thing yeah. to see stuff about pedophilia in the, mm-hmm. in the news or on Facebook or Twitter, whatever. Neighbors. It's, huh? Neighbors. Yeah. Your neighbors is what she's talking about. The ones that live behind you. <clears throat> oh, so it has always been legal, but that's law is making it a crime? Okay, so what I read was wrong then. So so it's saying that it is a crime now. Okay. So then the question would be is why would you need a law to make that a crime? Okay. All right. So that's my fault. The information that I read was wrong. So it is a law to make it a crime, yeah. and it's always been legal in the yeah. state, but now it's a crime. Okay. Um, again, why do you need to pass a law to yeah. make that a crime? Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, I'm I'm kind of curious how long that's going to stand. Mm-hmm. If they're making it a law. I wonder how long before it's going to be that's infringed upon somebody's rights. But there, I mean, that's the problem. You have absolutely no morals. Yeah, but I mean, that's that thing. All that stuff. And here, here's the bad thing. What we're talking about here in 1 Corinthians 5 is this is a saved person that Paul's talking about. You know, and he keeps on going and talking about... Um, <coughs> In, in, in verse 3, notice he says, For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. All right? <clears throat> in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might, may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus... Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. What he's saying is, kick the guy out of your church. Separate yourself from that so that even things that are taking place out there in the world isn't taking place in the local assembly. And again, we've talked about this whole thing. The separation that we're dealing with here is the local assembly is to do this, Right? But then as the church, the body of Christ, we do the exact same thing too. Here's, here's the big difference, <clears throat> and we've talked about this before. It's with the spirit of grace and love that we do this stuff. We don't do it just to put people down to put people down and that we can say, you know, well, I've unfriended 14 people that blah, 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 whatever. I mean, you're just doing that to make a show of the flesh. Or I've been unfriended by X amount of people this week, and it's just a fair show of the flesh on Facebook. That's not the point of it. You know, we talked about this on Friday night. God gave to the church some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Right? He gave them those positions to do something. Not one of them is to run a group on Facebook. None of them. At all. Now, is that a good medium to use? Yes, I mean, obviously we're using it. But how do you use it? To glorify yourself? No. And that's what most of that stuff has to do with, right? So <clears throat> when we look at this, the whole issue here is, is what? He's saying a little leaven leaveneth the whole thing. Leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. When you go back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus Christ is talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaven that he's talking about there is their doctrine, what they're doing with their doctrine. So you've got error in doctrine, error in behavior that you have to deal with. And as you think about this, go down to chapter 6, verse 1. Um, <clears throat> he says, Dare any of you having a, having a matter against another go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints? 
Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. And he's saying, don't go before the law and before unbelievers to take care of the issues in your church. He says, take care of it in your church. Now, there's two things there that he says, don't you know that you're going to judge the world and you're going to judge angels? Now, um, a person that's followed us online um, off and on for, for about a year or so, something like that, they contacted me and said, so what do you think this means that we're going to judge angels? Do you think that means we're going to rule over them? Well, the context here is what? Judging what? Ruling over people or actually what? Judging on situations or on, on behaviors or whatever it is. It's, it's actually talking about that. <clears throat> when you think about what's going on and everybody says, well, you, you can't judge me. Do you know what I like to say? One day I will. That verse right there tells me, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? What Paul's talking about here is if you see things in your, in your local assembly, you need to be able to tell the difference between bad behavior and bad doctrine and get the stuff out. He says, you're going to be judging something much bigger than that one day, and if you can't figure this stuff out, you can't be trusted to judge that stuff out there. And he's saying, get this stuff right first in the local assembly, and then you can go from there. Don't take your issues before the law. Take care of them in the, in the, in the local assembly. And then that applies to outside the local assembly as well. Right? This whole idea of marking and avoiding, and then marking and standing fast, or marking and cleaving, um, that's one of those things that he's dealing with here. And he's saying, I'm calling you all out. It's a shame on you that you're allowing this guy to stick around. Now again, if you had that stuff in your church, what do most people do today? They kick him out. They're changing. So then, what's that tell me about them? They can't judge in that, that small matter. So they're going to be able to be... Are they going to be able to be... able to judge in the bigger things? I mean, if you've got churches saying, well, I know that the Bible says... Oh, but we're going to... And I understand that so and so has issues with. I'm allowed them to teach my school class. That's where we're going. So much so that you're not going to. And, and here's where it's going to happen. These people down here are going to look just like these people, and they look just like those people. They're afraid to mark and avoid today for fear of what? Losing their people and losing their money. Every one of them. They don't want to call stuff out because they're afraid to lose that stuff. And we're fortunate here because nobody pays me any money to come here. <laughs> That's the fortunate thing. We don't have to worry about that. So I'm just going to go with what the verses say. 
and somebody walked through the doors and they didn't like what we said and they left, that's okay. That just means one less person we have to kick out. Right? But that's what he's doing. And, and here's the thing. This is a serious issue. And this is why I say it's, it's up to each and every one of us to choose how we apply this stuff and whether we apply it to what the verses actually say or do we just start making exceptions for certain things. Because it's easier. Because it's more convenient. Right? Do we, do we say... We're going to cleave to and stand fast with the people who follow the right example, or are we going to look at these people and say, "Well, we don't really want to cause the trouble, so we'll just let them do their thing and and we'll just allow them, and maybe one day we can convince them otherwise." Paul says, after the first and second admonition, what do you do? And you move on. If you and here's the problem, this is what a lot of people don't do. They mark and avoid without talking to the person, trying to convince them otherwise. They just mark and avoid. They just X out this guy, X out this woman, X out this person, and they move on. They never go and talk to the people, find out what they believe, find out why they believe it, and try to convince them otherwise. But that's what we're supposed to do. In the, in the spirit of grace and love. And it's, it's odd to me that grace people are missing that more often than anything. If anybody should be able to apply 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it should be saved people who understand Paul's gospel and the, right, and the, and the scriptures right that divide it. Um, <clears throat> Go back real quick to Romans chapter 1. Uh, we'll talk about the Aaron doctrine here in just a second. <clears throat> now, when, when, when we think about this, this is, and I, and I, I was going to bring it, but I forgot to. <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, verse 11. Paul says, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. There's a saying that I wrote down a year or so ago when the whole... Everybody's been forgiven at the cross 2,000 years ago, whether you're saved or unsaved. When that whole issue came about, everybody was attacking anybody like us that said, no, you're only forgiven the moment you believe. And then they say, well, y'all are Calvinists because you don't believe it's to everybody and all that junk, and that's it's just wrong. So anyway, one of the things they said, well, you all are creating division among the, bo the body. And this verse right here made me think of something. <clears throat> and actually, some people that thought differently than I did, they actually liked this statement when I posted it. So how can we, who are standing on sound doctrine, be the ones that are actually creating division? And you think about that for a second. That's, that's what verse 11 and 12 is right there dealing with. If you stand on sound doctrine, then who's really creating the division? So think about this way. Go back to Romans 16. <clears throat> and it's not a pointing fingers, who's doing, the, who's doing the division and all that stuff, but here's what I want you to think about. What does... Paul say the issue is is notice verse 17 now I beseech you brethren mark them that what cause divisions and offenses contrary to 
the doctrine which ye have learned. So if you're preaching the doctrine, how can you be the ones creating the division? Who creates the division? Those who are contrary to and cause division, they're the ones that are teaching contrary to the doctrine. So then when we think about really what's going on, what it comes down to is what's the doctrine? Who's right? Who's wrong? Well, that's, that's the slippery slope that it usually comes in on is who's right and wrong. Well, when you see somebody, in fact, do this real quick. Um, th this, is, this is an easy one, right? Um, look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 21. But the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto who? All. Right? How many people have access to the righteousness of God, which came by the faith of Jesus Christ? Unto all. And upon all them that believe. So who actually has the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, applied upon them, are those that what? Believe. Simple, right? Because that's what the verse says. It's available to everybody. Unconditional. But it's only upon them that believe. The condition there is what? Believe. Well, then somebody comes along and says, yeah, but believing's a work. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to him that worketh what? Not. Not. All right? So if you don't work, then he says what? But believeth. Well, what's that verse tell me? Does believe, is believing a work? If you don't work, but you believe, then believing's not a work. Never has been, never will be. So then, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So then, how do you get righteousness? Is believe. Are you righteous before you believe? No. You're righteous after you believe. That's a simple one, right? Another one we could go to is um, go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, um, start, off in, start off in verse 7. He says, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should obey not the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For, brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty as an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. When he goes through here, he says, If I'm preaching circumcision, why am I being persecuted? The issue there is what? The whole thing that he's dealing with is the little leaven. Here he's talking about a doctrinal issue. He's saying, 
Don't let people teach you that you have to be circumcised. And he says a little leaven, leaven on the whole lump. He said the same thing about the behavior and he's saying the same thing about the doctrine. And if you allow a little false doctrine into your life, what's that going to create? More false doctrine. And it's one of those things when we talk about the book of Romans, which is why we spent so much time on it. The book of Romans is the foundation of everything. And if you don't have the right foundation, your house that you build on, it's going to fall. It's going to crumble and it's going to fall on top of you. And so here Paul is saying what? Verse 12, I would even that they were cut off which trouble you. That should make us think of Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Verse 6, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that, 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 that called you into this grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. How did they pervert it? They changed it by adding something to it. In this situation, it was circumcision. But though we are an angel from heaven, which uh, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be what? Accursed. That's the same thing as cut off in chap chapter 5, verse 12. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we have received, let him be accursed. Let's take a look at that error in doctrine. He's saying, cut them off, get them out of your local assembly. You know, it's one of those things I could, if I had somebody come, for instance, in, in April when we're gone, if I asked somebody to come here and preach and we had everything set up and they came in and preached <clears throat> um, and they taught something wrong, it would be our job to what? Call them out on it. Find out, are you going to change your mind based on some verses? And if not, what do you do? Never have the guy come again. Or a woman. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But I mean, that's, that's one of those things you think about. That's the issue that, he, that, that Paul's dealing with there is let them be a curse. Let them be cut off. Don't have them in your assembly ever again. That's one of those tough things that you have to do sometimes, especially... You know, as far as the whole body goes, it's a little easier. If you have if you have real friendships in the local assembly, that's tough to do. I mean, for you all, it was hard for you to leave your old church because of people that you know and you love them. And, and I know that's tough. When we left our church, who was here that was tough to do they wouldn't put people out that taught false doctrine they even brought them back in had him preach some more just because we didn't have a pastor but that's one of those things like I said that, that we keep in mind <clears throat> As we, go, as we go through these things, uh, this, is, this is the kind of stuff that we have to kind of keep in mind as we go through because <clears throat> once, we, once we do this, once we make the choice in our mind that we're going to be separate from the world, the religious system, and erring brethren, whether it's a behavior or a doctrinal issue, there are consequences to that, and the consequences are we're smaller. That's a good, yeah, and that's kind of what I'm thinking, right? <clears throat> um, we might draw that one day. You're going to draw it for me? But I mean, that's one of those things when you think about, you know, when Christ talked about the, air, the narrow gate, it's narrow for a reason. And when he's talking about the broad gate, there's a whole lot more people up here than you even have down here. And then you have people down here. And like I said, 
Am I susceptible to teaching false stuff? Absolutely. But that's on you all and people watching to call me out when I teach something wrong. You did correct me today. Yes, you did. And I, I appreciate that. And I, yeah, I know. But I mean, that's that's one of those things. So when we go back to Romans chapter sixteen, um, <clears throat> verse seventeen, again, notice. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by what? Good words and fair speeches, what do they do? Deceive the hearts of the simple. And they know they're doing it. And at times they're proud of themselves for being able to do it. And again, that's why I said it reminds us of Romans chapter 1 where he's going through that list of stuff and he says at the very end, they not only have pleasure in themselves doing it, but they find pleasure in other people doing the exact same thing. One morning, I was listening to something on my iPad, watching or listening to some videos as I fell asleep, and I woke up the, the next morning, and this video is playing of Jesse Duplan is talking about when God took him to heaven. No, he didn't give me a poor bit that time. But he's talking about, and he's talking about all the things that he saw and how God allowed him to get to heaven to look at it so he would know. Do you know what I know about that person? If he's not here, he's here. And either way, he's going around deceiving the simple. Whether he's here or there, he's deceiving the simple. So he could possibly be saved just in false doctrine, or he might not be saved at all. But people are believing it. He's talking to Kenneth Copeland about this. He's up on Kenneth Copeland's stage, and he's talking about this stuff. And he's saying, God allowed me to see this. You know what we do with people with good words and fair speeches that go about and deceive the simple? Mark them and avoid them. That's easy with stuff like that. What's tough is when it walks through the door. And one day, it might be tough. You might have to kick me out. But I mean, that's, that's one of those things that we have to think about all the time. And as I've said, I could just as easily have fallen into some of this junk, the sonship stuff. When Ryan Anglin first brought that to me when we were down in Tennessee at the conference, when he first brought that to me about the sonship edification stuff, we talked about it back and forth, and he's like, I'm thinking it's pretty good. And the more I got into it, I'm like, I don't think it is. And so we talked about it, and he said, I want to, I want to thank you for all the time that you spent talking to me about this. And he's like, I think you're right, that it's wrong. And so then he started preaching against it, and then, of course, he fell off from that. Then you've got, um, what were some of the other things? Um, the forgiveness of sins 2,000 years ago, that whole thing about the misinterpretation of Second Corinthians chapter 5. When that stuff first came along, I just had this un, uneasy feeling. I could have easily fallen into that. Going through the tribulation. I mean, there's, there's things that are out there that great people are teaching that's wrong. And people are afraid to do that for whatever reason. There's people that I know that know better that promote stuff that's wrong. And they know better, but they still do it. And that's their decision. Like I said their decision. I'm not going to call you up and be like, hey, you better not do this. Your decision. It's their decision. If, you know, <clears throat> there's, there's, there's foolish questions. Um, somebody on Monday night, Paul, Paul tells us, avoid foolish questions because all they do is just create strife and all this other stuff. 
um, Monday night on Pow Talk, this person said, um, well, if, if what you believe is true, why did Paul beat himself? We're like, what are you talking about? So then they post the verse about where he says, I put my body under, um, I just lost the verse. I put my body under submission or something like that. And they say, well, Paul was whipping himself with whips because he was so horrible. And I'm like, no, he didn't. He knew he was complete and he didn't do that stuff. That verse isn't even talking about that. It's talking about something completely different. Foolish questions. And, and here, here's three of them. Here's three of them. And I've, I've answered them and I think I've got answers for myself and I'm, I'm okay with it. But foolish questions, he, Paul tells us, God through Paul tells us to avoid foolish questions. Because all it does is just lead to strife and, and vainglory and all that stuff. One question is, <clears throat> are the twelve in the body of Christ? There are grace people that fuss on both sides. I say no. And I've got reasons why I say that. But if somebody comes up and they ask me that question, I'm not going to answer that question. I've already answered it. Um, another one is, when did the church, the body of Christ begin? Was it Acts 9, 11, or 13? I've got reasons why I believe it's 9. If you want to believe it's 11, that's fine. If you want to believe it's 13, that's fine. Now, we have problems if you think it's Acts 2 or Acts 28, then we have problems. If you go around and teach that Paul was sent twice to two different groups of Gentiles, one that was a God-fearing Gentile, which didn't exist in Scripture ever, and then different types of Gentiles who were not God-fearing, and you teach that Paul started the church of the body of Christ in Acts 9, and then he started another one in Acts 28, and you've got Paul sent twice, that's a false doctrine. I'm going to call you out on it. <clears throat> but if you want to say 9, 11, or 13, that's fine. I'm not going to complain about that. If you want to call it mid-Acts and go from there, that's fine. Me personally, I believe it's 9. I've got verses that I think works for that. Um... There was a third one that I wrote down. Oh, who wrote Hebrews? That's another one a lot of people fuss about. The answer, God did. Did Paul? I say no. I've got a verse or two that'll, that would back that up. But that's me. In my own mind, those three things I've got answers for. I'm not going to fuss and fight with somebody over it. Somebody says, well, when did you think it started? I'm not, going to, I'm not going to fuss and fight about it. But Acts 28, I'm going to fight you tooth and toenail. Acts 2, same thing. You come around and say that all sins were forgiven at the cross, even unsaved people go to hell with their sins forgiven. That's a false doctrine. I'm going to call you out on it. If you say that you're not complete in Christ until you suffer for Him, which is exactly what sonship edification does. And I can name names on that one too, and it's one of those things. I'll give people names. But there's ways to do this and, and ways to do it by grace and love, not just out of just trying to destroy people. You know, people, some people's ministry, their whole purpose is just to destroy somebody else. That's their whole purpose. That's not, that's not what I'm wanting to do. But if you're complete in Him, you're complete in Him. You don't have to do anything extra to become more complete. And that's the thing that Sonship Edification teaches is you're not complete yet until you suffer for Christ. And there's people that would disagree with that statement, but that's what they teach. I've got it. I've got it written down we're complete and total in him there's nothing there's nothing else that we need and there are things that we that I would mark and avoid people but then there's also people I would mark and say let's go stand by this person and what happens is is if you notice where people start serving their belly and they by good words and fair speeches they go about to deceive the hearts of the simple 
He says, verse 19, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Do you know what Paul's saying? I want you wise about all the good stuff and all the junk out there. I want you to be simple about it. I don't even want you to consider it. Don't even think about the junk out there. Verse 20, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, um, when, we, when we think about some of these foolish questions and dumb questions and things like that, some of those things, like this person, they were just, on, on, on Pal Talk, they were just posting silly questions to create problems. They weren't there to learn anything. And you can tell when people do that. If people post stuff just to get riled up, you know they're not there to learn. The purpose of it is to what? To edify. That's the whole purpose. To edify one another. Not tear each other down, but build each other up. But if you have somebody here that's teaching something wrong and they won't change, he doesn't say, we'll just allow them to stick around. He says, come on. Get rid of them. Put them out, and then you don't have to worry about it. Go and learn and be wise of that which is good. Um, all right, questions there. Like I said, that stuff is... What I want to do next time is look more at this, how we go about doing this. Now that we know what the doctrine of separation is, how that works, what we're supposed to be separated from, how do we go about it this way? How do we do it charitably? Questions, comments, concerns? Not yet. Hold your applause till we're done. <laughs> Like I said, these two things are always easy. Where it gets tough is this down here. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Hopefully, I don't know. Wednesday nights have been, especially when I teach Monday night, it's just been rough. I don't know why. This past mo this past Wednesday, I was just wore out. But hopefully we'll be back on Wednesday nights this week. Going after it. <clears throat> so then, I guess we'll see you all Wednesday night. And... Uh, Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for coming. Close off in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. <clears throat> As we come through through this information, it's, it's tough stuff to do, it's tough stuff to talk about. Um, but then the application of it, that's where that's where really the rubber meets the road. And our prayer is that, that uh, we allow the verses to convince ourselves to possibly change the way we think about certain, uh, certain doctrines out there, certain, certain teachers out there, that it's going to be tough to do, um, to be able to, to mark and avoid, and then also to be able to mark and, and, and cleave to other folks. And we understand when we talk about these things, um, the actual application of this is the tough part, but we allow your word to be the final authority, and if your word tells us this, then this is something that we choose to either follow or not. Our prayer is that we allow your word to be the final authority in everything that we think, feel, do, and say, that we might be able to live a life glorifying to you and your son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.